Um, because today we are talking about con um, confirmation bias. And this is, um, if you're new to the whole idea of cognitive biases, this, this is like the big elephant in the room of kind of the thing that really <laughs> messes up human thinking. A lot of the other cognitive biases are in there, but none of them has more of a far reaching effect than confirmation bias. And um, here is, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to explore what it is and then think about the implications for that in our teaching, um, in our explorations, in our thinking, and how to, uh, how to, to deal with that with our students. Um, there is a, a warning that comes along with this workshop. And that is that um, if uh, by the end of this workshop, um, this is a workshop that if we uh, if it goes right, you will be a little bit less confident in yourself by the end of the workshop, and that's actually a good thing. Um, and also, um, some people think, but I'm going to learn about confirmation bias, and so then I won't do confirmation bias. And unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Um, there's, so there's, a, um, a, uh, there's a logical fallacy called the G.I. Joe fallacy. So I want to explain the G.I. Joe fallacy. When I was a little kid, there was this television show called G.I. Joe, in which these little heroes would run around and they would fight bad guys called Cobra. Well, at the end of every show, they would have a little segment where kids would be out playing in the backyard and one would be about to make a bad decision, like, let's go take candy from that stranger. And then one of the G.I. Joe characters would come up and say, like, wait, Timmy, that's not a good idea. They'd go like, oh, fireball, you're here. And they'd say, like, yeah, we don't want to take candy from strangers. That's not cool. And then they'd go like, oh, cool, now we know. And then G.I. Joe would look at you and go, and knowing is half the battle. So the idea is, like, if you know something, then you don't make that mistake anymore. But unfortunately, cognitive biases are more powerful than us just knowing things. We have to um, be, uh, to, to really stand on our head. So just knowing about it doesn't give you a shield against it, but still there are some things that you can do that, um, that, uh, that, that can, can help us be, uh, begin to deal with it. So first, I want to start by just a little presentation that I've prepared for your enjoyment about confirmation bias. And then I would love to for us to romp into a discussion. But also, we're going to do just a few little experiments here. Right. So this is going to be this is going to be fun. Um, let me see here. Sharing a screen. Um, hold on a moment. And play. Confirmation bias. All right, so what is up with this? Um, first, take uh, a moment to read this cartoon. I love this. Um, what it is, is um, our brains tend to um, look for um, look for sort of supporting evidence to support what you already believe. Um, related to this is the idea of desirability bias. Um, which is that our brains tend to um, look for reasons to support things that we um, want to be true. Um, so those two are kind of tied together. Um, but the results of this sneak into our ways of thinking in all sorts of different and interesting ways. So first, we're going to do just a little experiment here. And so I've got numbers in a sequence here, and I've got a rule that I've made to line these numbers up in a sequence. 
And what your challenge is, is to, um, you can test this by, um, uh, you can test this rule by um, putting in a, a sequence of numbers, of three numbers. And that will either be, I will either say that that, so that sequence is true or that sequence is false, all right? That it follows my rule or it doesn't follow my rule. And what you want to do is to try to um, guess my rule, try to see if you are correct. And so what I'd like you to do on a piece of paper right now is to write down a few sequences of numbers that you think would be helpful to test this rule. Um, so why don't you do that right now, just on a piece of paper? Actually, um, let's 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 put it in the chat. I, as I said here, we'll put it in the chat, but don't hit send. So we're going to put this in the chat, but don't hit send. What sequences of numbers would be helpful? Are you ready? On your mark, get set, hit send. This is interesting. This is interesting. All right, so um, let, let's take a look at this. Um, so um, Aisha, uh, 16, 32, 64, um, yes, that fits my rule. Uh, Linda's uh, 3, 6, 12, yes, that hit, fits my rule. Um, Kate, 16, 32, 64, that one does not, uh, that one is, doesn't work. Um, Rebecca, yes, that works. Um, Clark, 16, 32, 64. Interesting. Kate and Clark put in the same thing. That one doesn't work. Um, 3, 6, 12, that works. Jack, 16, 32, 64. Inter oh, oh, yeah, so, yeah, oh, sorry, sorry. The 13, sorry, 16, 32, 64 does work. <laughs> and, and this is what happens when dyslexics try to look at numbers and we scramble around. So um, 16, 32, 64, that one works. Uh, 16, 32, 64, that works. Yes, that does work. Um, um, 10, 20, 40 works. 10, 20, 40, um, 6, 12, 24. Now, um, and so all of those work. Now, what I'd like you to do is to kind of See if um, we're about to put in another sequence of three numbers just to further test it. Um, and what I want you to do is to um, notice how confident you are that you are correct in your understanding of my rule. Put another one in, and when I say go, we will go on your mark. Get set. And go. Five, ten, twenty. Five, ten, twenty. Four, eight, sixteen. Twenty, forty, eighty. Yes, those work. Here's an interesting one. Kathy put in three, nine. 81. Yes, that works. 20, 40, 80 also works. <clears throat> but isn't that interesting? Um, probably most people sort of picked up that four is bigger than two, and the eight is twice as big as the four. And so we're getting these sequences like 5, 10, 20. Um, 
And so in the, the things which we put in to test our rule were things which we thought um, should work. So, um, so the question was uh, from E, does 3981 work? Um, isn't this squared rather than times two? 3981 works. Laura Markham just put in something interesting. 2359, that doesn't work. 123, Kathy H, yes, that works. Have you changed your thought about what the rule is? 7, 14, 28, 3, 2, 1, no. Eleven twenty one five. Nope. Seven forty five four hundred and fifty six. Yes, Clark, that works. So notice that at the start, though, um, two six seven. Yes, Laura, that works. If you think you know what the rule is, we're about to put that into the chat. Um, one point two, one point three, one point four. Yes, that works. 1, 1 1.2, 1.5. Yes, that works. If you think you know what the rule is, we'll type that in. And when I say go, let's put that in. On your mark, get set, and go. That's right. <laughs> the numbers are just getting bigger. That's all there was to my rule. But notice how at the start, when we thought it was I'm going to double this and then double that, that we kept putting in things that were examples of sequences that we thought would work rather than things that would test. And if I look back here, the first one um, that we had, um, where was it? Where, um, where Kathy H., put in something that was a little bit different. Well, there was used doing squaring, right? But, and when that worked, right? So she was putting in something that, um, or, or when uh, we started towards the end here, you know, getting things like one, two, three. What you're doing is if you think, if, if I just kept putting in things that were doubling, I would have kept getting positive, yes, you're right, yes, you're right, yes, you're right. And what I'm doing is putting in um, answers that will, or I will kind of try to just confirm that I'm right. Instead of test, to, instead of to give a test to try to do something that would be wrong. Um, so, we actually learned more from these ones that um, kind of broke that rule by getting those ones where we said, oh, no, that's wrong. And it's a little bit counterintuitive because we think that if I'm getting right answers, I'm moving closer to the truth. But it was by those one, two, threes or Laura's 23, five, nines that we actually start to zero in on what the rule is. One, 100, um, and then uh, 100,045. You know, yes, that works. And then we get to, so those, those, those ones that were not just confirming that I'm right gave me the 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 it got me the closest to starting to figure this out. Wasn't that weird? But notice how easy it was at the start just to put in things where I know what this rule is, so I'm going to put in another thing that works with the rule. Now I'm going to mess with your brain a little bit more. Um, I am going to put out. Um, I have a set of cards. And some of them have letters on one side, but they have letters on one side and they have numbers on the other. 
And here is the rule. All right. If a card has a vowel on one side, then it has an even number on the other. So vowel on one side means even number on the other. And I'm going to lay these cards out for you. And what I would like you to do is we are going to test that rule. You can turn over as many cards as you want to test that rule. And, but you don't want to turn over any cards that you don't have to turn over in order to test that rule. So um, let me jump over. So what is the small, smallest number of cards that you can turn over? Here's seven. The letter B. A four, an A. And let me show you the rule again. We want to test this rule. Which cards would you turn over to test the rule? Hmm. And notice that there's an answer that jumped to your head. Notice there's an answer that jumped out to you. Now, Go back and look at that answer that jumped into your head first and don't trust it. Because I wouldn't do something that would be that obvious. You want to test the rule. Now, if you um, have a thought about which ones you would turn over, let's type that into the chat right now. Notice which ones occurred. Uh, actually, first, first. Um, uh, let, let's do first first pass instead of, of typing into the chat and don't don't hit send yet. What I want you to do is to type in to the chat the the ones that sort of intuitively feel like they should be right, right? Just your kind of gut feelings like ah, I think this one and this one. Like what kind of first sort of hit you? And when you're ready. You can hit send. I see A and four, A and four, I see A. Seven, A and B. First I want to turn over to D, then decided A and seven. A and seven. All right. So let's if there's a vowel on one side, then it has a number on the other side. So people are saying A. So seeing lots of people putting in A. Well, let's turn over A. Now, if A has a uh, number on the other side, that would support our rule. If it doesn't, if, if, sorry, it doesn't have an even number. If there's an odd number there, that would go against the rule. So this would be, this would be a great test, right? So if I turn this over, and let's see what it says. Yes, if there's a car card where even the rule is being followed, if it were odd, then the um, it would disprove the rule. So turning over A is awesome. Right. Now, what I'd like you to do is what um, type in. We know that A is good. Um, and for, for to really test this, um, what I want you to do now is to type into the chat what other card or cards you would need to turn over in order to test this rule. And when you're ready, hit send. Interesting. Well, let's see what happens. <clears throat> um, if I 
turn over B. So B is not going to be really helpful. Um, this card could be even or odd. Neither would say anything about the rule. And why is that? Um, because our rule is just if there's a vowel, then there's going to be an even number. So consonants, we don't have, this isn't saying the reverse. We're not saying that if the rule isn't that if it uh, is a, um, a, a vowel on one side, then it's an, an odd number. The rule is specific to vowels. And so a consonant is not going to really help us out. Let's take a look at number four. All right, four is an even number. Decide for yourself if this is gonna be helpful. Here it comes. Nope. The rule says if vowel, then even, and it's not the other way around. It doesn't say um, if uh, even, then vowel. So you could have a, um, an even number on uh, with, with either um, a vowel or a consonant on the other side. So this card would tell you nothing about the rule. And that leaves number seven. Let's take a look. A lot of people were voting for seven. Yep. This card would show a vowel if turned over, if the rule is correct. If it uh, shows a, a, a uh, so it sh should not show a vowel, right? Um, if it shows a vowel, the rule has been broken. So if I were to turn this over and there's a vowel there, I go like, oh, we just broke our rule. So this could help me. Now, thinking about this is a little bit confusing, right? And so, uh, uh, so honestly, show of hands, I'm gonna go over to the, my um, gallery view and take a look at all of you. Um, how many people found this confusing? Yeah? Okay, a bunch of us, right? Now, um, I'm going to do it um, the same problem, but just in a slightly different format. You'll see that it's a little bit easier this way. Here's my rule. Every time I go to Los Angeles, I travel by airplane. Which ones would you turn over to test that rule. See, this is exactly the same structure as what we were doing before. But when we have kind of this real world thing rather than vowels and consonants, consonants and evens and odds, it's a little bit easier to figure out. Um, every time I go to Los Angeles, I travel by airplane. So what should Los Angeles have on the other side? Yeah, better have an airplane, All right? So that would be a useful one. Um, every time, does New York help me? Hmm. Nope. That that was um, because because I'm I have nothing in my rule about how I travel to to New York. I could go to New York either by um, uh, either by uh, uh, air, airplane or by car. Um, so on this car one, what could this have on the other side of it that could disprove my rule? If this car one says Los Angeles on the other side, that goes against my rule, right? And airplane, I could take, I can still go by airplane to anywhere that I want. So in this case, you can sort of see that these two are my test. Sometimes in this situation, it's a little bit easier to see what's going on here. But what, what I want to kind of emphasize here is that the thing that gets us into trouble on these is if I am trying to get something to prove that I'm right, or sort of another example that I'm right, as opposed to kind of what test could disconfirm my idea. Let me just bounce back to 
this for a moment. Um, and, oops, here we go. Hold on a sec. I am going to go to, so what, what I want to just sort of emphasize here is that it can be tricky to sort of catch yourself in the act of trying to confirm that an idea that you have is correct. And if you're not actively testing if it's false, just things that will kind of help you kind of confirm that is correct, um, really don't do you any good. Um, now, where's the right button to push? It is, oh, right in here, hold on a sec. Right here. Zoom. Um, so just thinking a little bit more about the way that we um, think, there's some interesting um, research that was done on uh, looking at human brains and how we um, kind of handle the same information. Um, hi, floating meeting controls. There you go. Um, this um, is a is a study on the the uh, uh, the, the Bush Kerry election, and people were exposed to um, contradictory statements where a politician had said one thing and then said another thing. And both Bush had done that and Kerry had done that. And these were shown, so Bush contradictions were shown to Democrats and Republicans. The Republicans had a hard time spotting those Bush contradictions, but the Democrats were really good at it. But then when you showed Kerry um, contradictions to Democrats, they had a hard time spotting those. And the Republicans were really good at spotting those. And when you show Democrats and Republicans contradictory uh, statements by, um, by somebody that was not politically aligned, they were both pretty good at doing that. The other amazing thing that they found is that in these situations where they kind of had a dog in the fight, there were different, there were different parts of their brains that were light, lighting up when they were solving these than when they were looking at something that was not where, they, where it was not sort of a, a politically charged person. So their brains actually worked differently when they had, they had a dog in the fight. Here's another example of this. This is one of, my, one of these just amazing, amazing studies. Um, people were shown this math problem and it's about uh, medical researchers and um, they've got a new cream and you people are looking at, you put this, the, the skin on, the, on, on your body. So patients who did use the skin cream, this many got better, this many got worse. Patients who did not use the skin cream, this many got better, this many got worse. Um, so, and then people were asked to sort of figure out that, you know, Either you could check one of these two uh, kind of radio buttons. People who use the screen cream were more likely to get better than those who didn't, or were more likely to get worse than those who didn't. Um, so there's the results of the study, um, of this imaginary study. Now, what they, they did is they gave these, this template to, um, to some people, um, and they flipped it around. So notice how the top line here is different for, uh, in these two groups. One group of people in the study were taking a look at it where rash got worse is over here, and the other one's rash got better. So you notice it's the same numbers on both of these. They also calculated, they had people do some, a bunch of math problems and figure out how good they were at math. And here's what they found. This is how many you get correct. And this is how good you are at math. And this should not surprise anybody. And that is that 
people who were bad at math didn't do as well at getting the correct answer. And the better you are at math, the better everybody got. But then you say, why is it that we have these four categories over here? Um, shouldn't it just be the one, there, there are two study groups because one was the rash gets better and the other is that the rash gets worse. So what are these CR and LDs? Well, I'm glad you asked. The CRs are conservative Republicans. The LDs are liberal Democrats. And guess what? It doesn't make any difference if you are a Democrat or a Republican. The only thing that makes difference is how good you are at math. And basically, everybody uh, uh, who's better at math, whether you're a conservative or a Republican, can solve this thing about face cream. OK. Not too surprising, but here's the surprise. Here's what we had before. You then give those same people another set of problems that looks kind of similar. But this time, you're talking about a ban on carrying concealed handguns in public. And whether crime went up or down. So if you, and so there's these two study conditions. One of them is going to support the idea that um, having concealed uh, carry guns reduces crime. The, uh, the, the Democrats, though, have a dog in the fight where they want to say that, you know, I think it, that, that, that having just sort of more people around with guns, you know, concealed, this is this crime's gonna go up. So in the the face cream example, nobody had a dog in the fight, but in this case, they did. And here's what happens, right? Again, here is what we saw with the face cream. Here is what happens with the same math problem, but with conservatives and uh, Republicans looking at the uh, concealed carry thing. If the, the liberals, um, um, if, if they were looking at the thing where, uh, the, the, uh, something where um, crime, um, if, if liberals were, were looking at a study that, that said that crime decreases, they got it right. When liberals were looking, or when conservatives were looking at something that's saying that banning concealed carry increases crime, they got it right. But both the liberals and the, uh, the, 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 the liberals and the conservatives got the problems wrong when they were given an example that went against what they wanted to be true. They actually got the math problem wrong when they had a dog in the fight. So just a wonderful way of kind of looking at how messed up our, our thinking is. Um, one more kind of a, a very interesting um, study. Um, this was, they took a bunch of people and um, uh, were, we're, we're looking at the 200, uh, the 2016 election. And uh, so some people wanted Hillary Clinton to win. Some people wanted Donald Trump to win. And what they wanted to separate out was what is the impact of who you want to win versus who you think would win. And what they found was that who you wanted to win um, if you're given some polling results and it showed what you wanted to happen, you were much more likely to think that it was good data and good science and change your thinking if it, can, uh, if, if it went along with what you were already thinking. If, however, it was showing you something that you didn't want to be true, you were must, much more, uh, less likely to kind of go along with that. And this is, um, 
And whether you thought Hillary Clinton would win um, or Donald Trump would win, um, what your expectation was was actually less important than what your hopes, your 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 preference would be. So in the ways that people interpreted this poll was com completely different things, people looking at the, at the different poll based on, um, on, on what they wanted to happen. So in summary, you've got on one hand, there's evidence. Um, and that either supports or doesn't support a belief that you have. And in the best case scenario, these two things overlap, that what you believe is supported by evidence. But, and this is the way that we feel that we are kind of operating. I have a belief system that's based on evidence. But the research shows that it is this way for none of us. There is a zone where our beliefs overlap the evidence, and we overweight this. We, we pay lots of, lots of attention to this. This is what we see. But what we don't see is the beliefs that we have that are not supported by evidence or evidence that doesn't support our beliefs. This is off our radar. But what we do is we just look at this zone in here to say, see, I knew I was right all along. So um, actually, I'm going to escape. Um, so that is kind of a, <clears throat> a, a whirlwind tour of um, some thoughts about uh, confirmation bias. And um, what I would love to do is to open this up to a discussion about um, what are the implications of this for us as educators, as parents, and as teachers? Um, and uh, your thoughts about the subject. I'm going to start with Ivea. Um, I'm going to add you into the spotlight here. Hey there. Hey there. This is <clears throat> this is fun. <laughs> it makes me wish that we had more of those things where you have the rule and where you have the cards. It makes me wish we could do that more often. Um, I think that they're good brain brain workouts. Um, it's, it's a crazy brain workout. And and what what's what's neat about it, like when I did it, I got it wrong. I got it wrong. Um, I picked ones where I was trying to confirm that my idea was right instead of testing my idea. And then I was like, ooh. It makes me wonder if that falls under the categories of either deductive or inductive reasoning. I have to admit, I'm not very good with math sometimes, um, but I like the logic and the fun in that. Um, but either ways, with the confirmation bias, it makes me think, and I know I said this to you yesterday too, that it stifles our curiosity in a lot of ways, because if we think we know the right answer, then we're not going to be as curious about what could be or or how or other things. That's why one thing I appreciate that you taught me that I think is a good thing to teach students is the why web. So take something that you think is true, that you're convinced is true, remake it into a question, and then connect all of the possible reasonings why something could be, or connect all of the possibilities to what if it's because of this or that. And I think that that's important because I think when we go out into nature, we'll immediately assume certain things because of whatever pre-knowledge or pre things that we think is true out there. So we'll see, I don't even know. Um, I'm not even sure what a good example of that would be because there's so much I don't know. Um, but maybe we see a certain animal behavior and we think, oh, you know, that animal is doing some sort of a courtship dance. In reality, the animals are trying to bite each other and, and hurt each other or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but but um, I think that that's why the why webs can be really powerful is that then we could say, okay, we observed this behavior. And so instead of immediately labeling it as something, then we write down um, and observe the exact things about it and then come up with the whys after that. And I think that'd be interesting to try in some other subjects too. Um, and then another thing that makes me think of is that I think sometimes we, we have trouble questioning our sources of information. Um, and we have trouble sometimes telling if our sources of information are 
are good ones. Um, I remember we talked about that once in an environmental studies class that I had. And especially now with the internet and a lot of kids being able to go on the internet to get information, then it can be really hard to trace knowledge back to its original source since a lot of places on the internet don't cite their sources. Um, that's right. Then so it leads to a question about whether this, the, because I mean, now we're, we're looking into old things like psychology or other things where the data assembling was really off because we were taking it from select populations instead of from a bigger source. And so now old studies are being redone anyway, because we're finding out that the, that the sampling size was really limited. So that just makes it even more confusing, but I guess that's why curiosity is a good thing to stay open-minded and to try to write down objectively what we notice in the world instead of just assuming. Yeah, and there's a, a, there's a vulnerability to curiosity that, 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 that possibility that I um, may be wrong. And that, that, can be, that can be really hard to do. I like that thought. Um, I'd like to bring in Kate on this. Kate, hi there. Oh, we have to make you able to unmute. So we're, we're, we're still kind of living in the shadow of the Zoom bomber. So there's this sort of awkward thing that we have to do here. Okay, you're good. Great, okay. So um, just two things is one, uh, I think this is why I, enjoy teaching, especially like younger kids is because they don't have as much prior knowledge. And so they say things that are just totally out there and you're like, oh, wow, could that be true? Like, oh, you might be right. Oh, that's really interesting. I never thought about it that way before. And um, I think that's really, really one of my joys of teaching is seeing that happen. Um, but it's so interesting you bring up the question of source is because my daughter came home saying, did you know that it is illegal to name your child king or queen or princess. I'm like, that's interesting. Where'd you get that information from? And, you know, so one of her friends said that she, you know, read about it on the internet. <laughs> and I was like, well, what do you think? You know? And so, um, and then I actually, there was a news article on like our local news page that was about that these, that there are, but it was very vague because it said that there are states that don't allow certain names. Here is a list of names that may not be allowed. And, but it made it sound like in the US, these names are all completely illegal. And um, so trying to work her through that logic of like, does that mean that they're necessarily legal in our state? How could we use other sources of information doing all that sort of stuff? Of course, <laughs> this is my daughter after a long day of school is like, oh my God, mom. <laughs> And also, you know, she has some confirmation bias at that point because it was her friend who was saying it. She just wanted to believe her. And it's like, this is just like a silly thing. Why are we questioning it? And so it's kind of how do you just like, what was so interesting what you just said is it's a vulnerable moment. And I think as educators, we can, you know, we can practice and train ourselves to be vulnerable and be open to that curiosity. But how do we lead our kids through that when they are like, absolutely convinced that they are wrong <laughs> about, I mean, they're convinced they're right about something. And we might think, you know, hey, let's walk through, like, how do we walk through that with like really being respectful of them and their experiences and their knowledge and not have it be like, I'm questioning you and I don't believe you. Um, yeah. yeah. That, I think that's a, that's a really, really important point because what you're teaching them there is and I think that the factoid itself is less important than the process which you use to arrive at selecting that factoid as being true. When you get into a discussion with people about is your belief true or not, it feels like this. When you're in a discussion about how did you come to that decision? You know, how sure are you about that? And how did you come to that decision? What was the process that you used by? What is the evidence for that? And, and we, then you're in a, an analysis of that evidence and it is less than kind of just budding with that, like here's a belief that I have. You also mentioned something that I think uh, when you said, you know, that's, that's interesting, like, you know, how, uh, you know, what was the, the, the website that um, brought to my mind that this phrase that I've been, you know, just beating into my kids from an early age, which is, that's interesting. What's the evidence for that? Right? And so it's first like, oh, that's interesting. I'm not saying that's true. 
right? That's interesting. Like that's a really interesting claim. And then what is the evidence for that? So they're, they're actually now using this on their teachers at school. <laughs> and <laughs> they came home like, I, Daddy, today I said to my teacher, that's interesting. What's the evidence for that? And the teacher stopped. And then like we had this whole talk about it. It was really fun, right? That, 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 that shouldn't be an attack. Um, you, just what you both just said just made me think of something. Um, another thing is, so from an early age, I was hearing from my godmother about something called primary sources or primary resources, um, which is where the way that she kind of described it is that the, the textbook written about, I don't know, the Rosetta Stone would be a secondary or, or source, but the Rosetta Stone itself would be the primary resource because that's where all of the interpretation comes from. That's the actual thing. And in a way, I think about that as sort of like with nature, the primary sources or primary resources would be what nature itself is doing. Um, and our, our nature journals are a bit closer to that, but they're still secondary sources in a way. Um, but it's a way that, but that kind of gets us to think about how to record things in a way that's true to this primary resource. So sometimes I think that could be a good thing for, I wish more people knew about that, um, about primary sources. Um, because then I think that it gives you a whole different perspective to how information is constructed in the world um, and how it's kept. Um, so there's that. Another thing um, is, speaking of the internet, a fun game I think to, to really use to illustrate that with, with littler kids especially would be to play telephone, <laughs> play the game of telephone. And then in that case, the primary source is the person who started the message. And then you can see how the message kind of gets distorted through different channels, unless you can kind of trace it back to the person who began the message and then figure out what they actually meant. Um, so just some thoughts about how to make it um, a bit more critical thinking about where, oh, go ahead, Kate. No, I really, I really love that idea. And I was thinking, because I've always played telephone with just one word, but I'm thinking how fun it would it, would it be is if everybody has like a slip of paper with like a fact on it, you know, we have so many bones in our body or whatever. And you have to, you tell it to somebody and they have to like walk across the room or like even into another room and try to tell the fact, you know, that there has to be this time gap because I'm thinking that's what I'm noticing a lot is that um, when you hear a fact and then, you know, a day has passed and then you're trying to repeat the fact, the amount of <laughs> information that's saved from hearing it originally, it even, it even more gets lost. And so trying to find, be really fun to do a game of telephone like that where it's just it's not even just like immediately like boom 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 like literally mishearing but it's also just that misremembering because it's so easy to distort your information up or down or you know ebbing house i think is that what it's called hmm? ebbing, house, ebbing house curve of forgetfulness i can't remember if that's the name oh dear no i'm actually being an object lesson Eek. okay Um, the, uh, so, um, I, I, I should, uh, was just, uh, Aisha was pointing out that the, uh, often the, so the Rosetta, Rosetta stone, that's your evidence. And then very often when we're talking about, um, say things in, in, in research, they were looking at evidence and then they wrote that into their paper. Then that's the primary source that all these other people are referencing. So that, that, that primary source can be the, um, I think it's probably useful to make the distinction that Aisha did between the primary source and the, and the evidence. Um, Billy Joe, love to bring you in on this. Hey, um, so I just seen in the chat, Jeff was asking like how this relates to nature journaling specifically. And so I wanted to chime in on, on an experience that I had with this exact thing. And so I, uh, this nature journaling while I was um, out on a or like on a camping trip this summer. Wait, wait, and, hold on. Um, I'm going to interrupt you for just a second. There's something yeah. a little bit odd happening with the audio. Maybe moving the microphone a little bit closer to your mouth. Um, and we'll. Is that better? I think so. Okay. It must have maybe just came out a little bit of the thing. Okay. okay. So while I was camping, I was uh, um, nature journaling slug. And so I made a very concrete. Um, observation based on something that I was really thought was true. And then I posted that my nature journaling, um, uh, um, my journal entries on Instagram, and someone immediately called me out and was like, that's not true. And I was like, oh, 
<laughs> so immediately, like, you have that. So I think with nature journaling, it's, you know, again, looking at, so I, I learned from that and I thought, okay, don't do that anymore because you obviously have made an assumption about something that you think you know or you read or you thought, blah, blah, blah. And I, I stamped it in that journal as like truth. And it wasn't truth. And then I took what that person said and I did more reading. So I was like, oh, they are right. You know, so I think when we're doing nature journaling, you know, like Avea was saying about the Y web is more our nature journaling pages being uh, directed to those possibilities um, and, you know, those Y webs, as opposed to maybe making them so concrete, or if we have an observation, then like, what are the possible possibilities around it? Um, and I think that that's probably um, like how I would think that it would connect into nature journaling is that a kid might see something and be like, well, that's what they're doing. Similar to I think what Abea was saying with like, that's a, they're mating and they're like, no, they're fighting. So I think just being really cautious in our nature journaling and then as educators, Really, I try to focus the kids on, you know, ask the question, like ask your wonder question or make your observation. And then what are the possibilities? And that I find with kids especially is that they have trouble being vulnerable to those possibilities. And so because they're looking for the right answers because in school we're teaching them that the right answer is the most important thing as opposed to being curious and being vulnerable and putting out those possibilities. And so I always, you know, encourage them to say, like, I'm not asking for the right answer. I'm asking for your thoughts. What do you think is going on, you know, based on what you're seeing? And I think that this, that's a potential way of helping with that confirmation bias because you're not asking them, like, what's the right answer? And I'm looking for that right answer. And then we'll debate it. I'm looking for what are your possibilities. And then we can have a discussion around it. And then we can all pull up. And I wonder if that also would sort of take away from what Kate was saying about, you know, turning into this sort of situation, like, you know, my daughter really is feeling passionate because it's her best friend saying this, when in reality, you know, that might not be the truth. So, you know, what are the possibilities, you know, and sort of do it like that. So that was a lesson that I, I personally had. <laughs> and so now I try to think about that with students as well. It's again, not looking for concrete, we're looking for those possibilities. And then, you know, we can say, I think you said that in the past before, is that we come up with all those possibilities, then you can say, okay, like, let's look at this possibility and what are, what are the chances that this one can be truthful or could be fact based on kind of what we know and then can you eliminate some of those? So in essence, I feel like that model that you've sort of been talking about for years, kind of testing those biases just by doing that process. So I'm wondering if that's like the nature journaling, how we can connect this idea into that and make that even more critically thinking within the pages of our nature journal as well. Uh, that, that makes absolute sense to me. Um, th this I idea that when you are trying to figure out why something or, you know, is, is that mating behavior, you know, having some structures where you are generating possibilities, um, for the sake of generating those possibilities. And that if you just on anything, if you just kind of come out with, there's gonna be the first idea that comes to you and that's gonna feel the most right because it was the first idea that came to you. And so that what you're then saying is to intentionally shake up that little etch-a-sketch of your brain by having then, okay, what else could it be? What else could it be? What else could it be? So if you've got several possibilities on the table, then that, and we're, we're, we're training ourselves to not to say, oh, it's this, to, to, to train ourselves, well, one possibility is that it's this. And I think like the ninth part of doing something like that is that that first initial thought could be partly right. It, it, it's, it could be partly right. Right, yes, like right. depending on species, depending on maybe this time of year, that is correct. But in winter, it's not. Or you know what I mean. So being able to take those parts and pieces, I think, is you're kind of forming your own test, um, which is what we were sort of talking about earlier. And I, I think that might be helpful. And I, I think you know, as an educator as well, we were talking about curiosity and being vulnerable. That we don't know all the answers, and we don't know we're all right. I, I, 
personally feel this all the time. And I've just like owned it because a lot of people will say to me, oh, Billy Joe's the expert. She's the expert. She's in outdoor education. I'm like, yo, like, no, not the expert, not even a little bit, still learning and being able to say to the kids, you know what? I don't know the right answer to that, but let's come up with some ideas and thoughts. I can give you my experiences and pieces of my knowledge and then you can give me some of yours and maybe together we'll come up with, you know, some kind of possibility together. So I think really owning that vulnerability is also a really great way of modeling that to our students as well, without it being like engaging in sort of like a battle, like, no, I'm right. Just because I'm an adult doesn't mean I'm right. Right. Like it's, I think, I think we've hopefully put that out to pastor a long time ago. <laughs> There's lots of kids that come up with things that are way smarter than I would ever think. So, you know, I think just owning that vulnerability is a really good modeling. Uh, I think that's, that's a critical thing that we can do as adults and educators, as parents and as teachers. Um, I'd like to bring Lindy into this conversation. And also I see Aisha, uh, you've got your hand up. And so first I'm gonna bring in Lindy and then, um, uh, then uh, we'll bounce over to Aisha. Um, yeah, I mean, Billy Joe just hit it right on the head. Like what I was exactly thinking, I was just reading this study. Um, I'm a teacher of teachers. And so I was reading a study about professional development. And in this particular professional development study, they showed teachers different videos of kids doing like very typical things that they might see in their classroom, very routine things. Um, and one group of educators engaged in, well, actually all the educators engaged in this kind of like cycle of inquiry about that. Um, the main difference between the groups is that one group then brought that cycle of inquiry to the collective group of teachers and they discussed it as a group with all these diverse educators who are all bringing their own prior knowledge to whatever they observed. So they may have observed like, you know, kids who are disinterested in an activity um, with their head on the on the desk, right? And, and it might be something that you see fairly frequently depending on your classroom. Um, for some educators, it was a little ho-hum, but for some educators, particularly the ones who engaged in this discussion piece, they were able to pull so many different solutions to respond to that scenario as compared to the educators who did not have that discussion piece and just did kind of a self-reflective cycle. And it was a huge disparity in the number of solutions that they generated to this kind of ill-structured problem face. Um, so I think, you know, getting your own evidence, gathering that with your own, you know, five senses and collecting that is a really important step, but then sharing it with a diverse group and seeing how they've all created their own interpretation of that evidence through their own prior knowledge, through their own knowledge structures and their own brains, and then merging those things to create even more possibilities. I think that's just such an important piece of this puzzle. That's great. If you have, uh, could I get you to send me um, a, a link to that study? Um, or if you maybe you can put that in the chat, that would be that'd be really interesting to 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 look at. So yeah, a lot of meaning making making happens in those discussions. So in the next generation science standards, what the, something that they're trying to do is to get students to have these um, arguments from evidence. And but we do have so little experience doing that because we don't see that you know modeled by our peers. And in the classrooms that I grew up in. We weren't doing that in the class. The science class was more this sort of things being kind of dictated down to a vote. Now you're going to put this in with that, and then you're going to measure this, and now I'm going to do that. So instead of kind of coming up with these ideas and having those discussions um, and uh, having practice kind of changing my mind about something in the presence of, of, of evidence, that's, that's really um, helpful, Lindy. Let's bring in Aisha. Um, to, hey there, and you can now unmute. Hi there. 
Um, thanks, Biddy Joe and Lindy and Jack. Um, so I put this in the chat too, but this whole discussion keeps reminding me of the whole language of uncertainty we conversation we had. And I've been putting that into my nature journaling a lot more. Like even Kate's example is like, I think the birds are bobbing their heads because, and then you can sort of keep it in there. And uh, it's a easy, easy way to kind of come at it. It feels it's been really useful to me to kind of keep doing that. Um, and uh, for people um, who aren't familiar with it, maybe tell people a little bit about that kind of the idea of the language of uncertainty and what what that means. Well, we were talking about that in science, right? Like you yeah. just, unless you have concrete evidence, it's using words like perhaps, maybe, I think, you know, um, all those words that sort of show that you're just kind of hypothesizing here and thinking about it as a theory. Um, even, you know, even saying something like the birds are doing that up because they're courting. It's like, well, all you're seeing is a head bob or singing probably because it's courtship time, but they cannot tell us that. It's all, I mean, I've actually gotten more horrified at the scientific writings I read. And I'm like, there is no way most of this could have been proven. It is really, a, I think, you know, that this is courtship behavior or defense behavior. Most likely slugs are slimy to protect themselves. You know, how much evidence is there actually that they produce extra slime, you know, you know what I mean? Is that kind of, um, yeah. Um, and I think the other thing I wanted to say also going back to Jeff getting us started on bringing us back into nature journaling is I was thinking uh, just the other day, I've been uh, journaling the plantain in my backyard, the narrow leaf plantain um, and I realized I initially wanted to confirm that every leaf I was looking at had five veins. And then as I was doing it, I thought, I wasn't even thinking about confirmation bias. I was just kind of like, I feel biased about it. Um, and so I tried to randomize and looked at flip 10 leaves that I couldn't already see and looked at those 10 leaves. And then my note was simply like, out of 10 random leaves, all had five veins. You that know? Wonderfully specific. So trying to come at it that way for myself. And then this conversation is making me think, okay, next time, I was also looking at the calendula today and I was drawn to how many were pointing towards the sun. But again, I keep, trying to confirm my own bias that they're heading for the sun and maybe i should try and also look at how many are not pointing towards the sun right and can i start bringing that into my nature journaling um because i do keep looking for evidence of the pattern i think i'm noticing yeah, so that that that's a great buffer against confirmation bias when you have an idea to intentionally look for evidence that goes against your idea look for that and um instead of just for the things that, that that support your idea i think one more thing too to add to that is that understanding or recognizing the fact that just because it's true today or just because it's fact today doesn't mean it can't be disproved tomorrow and so i think you know what i mean like so you, you can say like blue jays are blue all blue jays are blue but like, what happens if one tomorrow is not blue because of some weird genetic thing that happens? You know, I say to kids like today, that's the evidence that we have that can support what we're saying. But, you know, can that be disproved like later? And the kids are like, yeah. And I'm like, yeah. And I think that that's one thing that we've seen, you know, even in the last two years going through this pandemic is that the science is changing continuously. And we sort of need to be open to the fact that just because that is what the evidence says today does not mean that that's necessarily what the evidence is saying tomorrow. And we need to be able to be open enough to right. be able to take in that new information to be able to then say, oh, you know, things are changing or whatever. Like I hear a lot of people like, you know, like my mom, 
will say like, wow, it's changing all the time. All the rules are changing. Everything's changing all the time. And I just try to be like, well, mom, that's science. And that's, that's how that works, right? But if you are somebody, you know, who went to school when we were just being told things, that being able to flow with that change, I think can be a lot as well. And so I think also knowing who's in front of you and how you sort of approach those conversations about the fact that just because it's backed potentially today and backed up with evidence does not mean that that's going to be there tomorrow, right? So maybe the conversation I'm having with my mom is going to be different than the kids I had a conversation with who were in grade three today who are much more sort of open to that fact, right? Whereas my mom maybe is a little bit more set in her sort of thinking and in her ways of sort of being with that so I think that thing too is just like really as an educator in a nature journal is to really make sure that they understand that that it can change everything can change and that's part of that evolving world that that we're in wow. um yes um and, uh, and and just to sort of to tie into that I think Laura Markham um is making a, a really good point about um relativism that people can kind of get into this. And, and actually, I'd love to bring you in on that if you feel comfortable doing so, uh, Laura, because I think that's a, that, what, that, that, that I, I'm, I'm going to, uh, first, let me all explain something. But what I'm saying is not the same as relativism. Um, and, and maybe we can uh, add you in the spotlight. And then I'm going to allow you to unmute. Uh, I guess you already can. So the, the idea is that on, on any explanation that you have, you're going to take a provisional position on that. And on one side, you're rejecting, and on the other side, you're accepting. This is different than a dichotomy with true-false, two separate flags, two different poles. This is a continuum of the, and you are somewhere along this line, and with every little bit of evidence that you get, you can move one direction or another. And you always can move back, and that, the the sort of the and 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 so, so sort of saying that I'm going to support a claim in proportion to the strength of the evidence for it is different than relativism and maybe Laura you can unpack that for us. Well, so relativism is actually, I mean, from what I understand, it developmentally it's a stage that we all go through too where you'll go from um, uh, that there becomes a thing where it's like, well, everybody's right. Everybody has their own opinion and everybody can see it, however, and that's fine. And we don't have any way of, of judging or gather using our evidence to make a decision. It's just, yeah, I mean, that that's, what I remember from my psychology. You're, you're, you're heard, you hear people sort of frame it like, you know, you've got your truth and that's your truth. And I got my, yeah. And I have my truth. There. And as and a, a yeah. scientist, uh, somebody who has done science, I, I just feel a little anxious when people want to uh, emphasize a lot of the tenuousness of science because there is a lot of rigor in how we understand things. And, you know, science is a good way of, of learning things, but it also has no ability to prove anything because you can't test everything, right? So it's, and, and uh, our, it's just, it's see, you're just saying this pattern really seems to hold up. It's still holding up. This connection still holds up. This explanation still holds up. This, and so, you know, ideally scientists are aware that if you get new evidence, you know, you might have to rethink things. And a lot of scientists have been caught with their, by that, because they, they were so enamored of their ideas that they, you know, the, the new evidence was like, that, you know, they just, you know, and, you know, and scientists are real people. Um, but um, if we, we, if we emphasize too much how the, the changeability of science, I'm just afraid that then our students are more susceptible to the, you know, to, oh, well, yeah, okay. So, but, you know, that's, 
who knows if that's really right, you know, or, you know, what? Yeah. Okay. So it's true today, but you know, it's like that you want them to understand that con that conclusions, which are not framed every single time as with the evidence that we have and the testing that we've done and all the ways we've looked at it so far, this seems to be our best idea of what's happening. Yes, that's a great way to right? frame it. They don't, they don't put that at the beginning of every conclusion in every science paper. It's just, and some of that is, you know, there are things that we, we do accept as true because otherwise you couldn't get on with your thinking, right? But or, you, or, or that's the, the, the power then of the, the idea of provisional acceptance. Right. So we're not saying true false. We're saying we're going to give this idea provisional acceptance. And we give gravitation provisional acceptance. Yeah. And if I and, fall, just fly off the planet one day, well, then we'll come back. Well, well, and, and, but, but, but actually, we're not going to fly off the planet one day. Right. Um, and it's, it's not like the sort of when science started, there were major revolutions in thinking about how things work. When people started this process of, well, let's make explanations based on evidence. Right, and then you're kind of going like, you know what, the 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 uh, the, the the geocentric model of the universe, it's not really working for me, right? And there are these like major changes, um, but nobody's going to come out tomorrow and say like, actually, the Earth is a cube, the Earth is a cube. You know, we 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 went from it being round to an oblate spheroid to then when you kind of look even more, it's slightly larger in the South Pole than the North Pole, right? And, um, you know, so what, what, what's happening is you're refining these things. It's not like tomorrow people are going to come up and say, yeah, it's a cube. It's a dodecahedron. They have come up and said it's flat. Yeah, well, and, 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 so, <laughs> and yeah, I don't know whether these people really, really, you really believe that or whether, yeah. But, you know, and so what we don't want, yeah, is the, this idea that that anybody can get up and if they 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 say science tells us or whatever, you know, that there's more to it. You have to. That, and that's why we teach kids how science works and we engage them in, you know, figuring things out. So I just I think that there is a balance. You have to balance but yes. between totally them. You know, science is an ever growing, changing understanding, but it's a pretty good understanding. It's useful. Because we, it's useful and we, we, and we work really hard at doing that. But if somebody wants, you know, you to jump off a, a bridge because they say science is gonna, it's gonna, you know, I don't, all you bungee jumpers up out there, but, um, <laughs> you know, you might want to check your facts, you know, you yeah. might want to check whether or not their evidence is sound, whether or not they've tested, you know, this in multiple ways before you jump off the bridge with that little rubber band attached to you. Totally. And I didn't, I didn't mean to come across that I was doing that. Oh, no, no, no. I, I, just, I think that we do yeah, that no, because we totally want not. to, to, we want them to see the part that, that the part that science is alive, right? I mean, absolutely, that, absolutely. That there wonder, are, there are, yeah. you could discover something. Yeah, for like sure. This last sure. week said, oh, this is great because you're just confirming what we already know. And I'm like, what? <laughs> no, 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 no. This, this is, that wasn't the, and they were looking at the standards and I was just like, no, that, that is not, yes, majority, there's not really new stuff, but that's not the, what's great about it. The great about what's great about it is that you can approach it like a scientist and figure out the same thing. It's not that, you know, and no, we're probably not going to find something new because we're all looking at the same universe. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it, in terms of it's not going to probably a third grader is not going to find out that, you know, magnetism isn't magnetism or whatever, but I don't know. It was a weird statement. I was like a couple of things that I'm really liking about this approach that you're you're taking is that it's you're you're not saying that so and you're making it really clear that scientists are not saying we have the answer. 
what we're saying is that we have a useful explanation that fits the evidence that we have at this time. And it's really useful. It's our, our understanding of gravitation is so useful that we can, again, send up that rocket and have it descend through the Martian atmosphere, land successfully, and then launch a freaking helicopter on Mars. That's a good, useful understanding of gravitation. But still, people are we, we the, the, the gravitation is really what feeling, causes it, right? And and we're, we're we're refining that and refining it. But it's 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 useful to us as an explanation for how things work. And by useful, what I mean is that it is predictive. So if this is true, then I would expect to see this and this and this. Each one of those things that it predicts is you can then test that. that that's, that's both that, that you can test it. And if it works, well, hey, right? If it doesn't work, if the predictions off of an explanation don't work, it is less useful. If the predictions do work, it is more useful. And each one of those predictions that you then test is another test of that explanation. But at some point, you're going to run into the, 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 the problems of it. Like, um, you know, I, Stein's got some ideas that are might like, run into problems at quantum, you know, uh, uh, zones that I don't understand, right? <laughs> um, but the, the idea of useful and being predictive, I think, is, 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 is key there. And so with when we do model, developing a model, you know, the whole process of, okay, do, you know, do the ideas you've represented in your model, can they explain what you've seen? Okay. And then if we learn more, come back to your model. Does it still, is it still able to explain that? If yes, okay, let's try something else. And if no, well, what, what, what do we need to change about the model? And so ideally children that who are experienced three-dimensional learning are going to have that experience of seeing that, you know, my understanding as represented by a model can get more sophisticated, can get better. And yet hopeful, I mean, that this is, you know, it's not the same thing. It's a representation of what's happening, right? And it's, it's, it's something that we can use to then say what's next, right? So. And, and but built into the explanation that you have of science and your kind of working definition of your describing, is you're describing a process that is humble. And I think that our humility is one of the best tools that we have in the face of confirmation bias, is to not to assume that we have the answer, not to assume that this is, this is, this is right. Um, well, you know what they say about a stoom, so I'm <laughs> not allowed to say that. So, um, but you know, there historically, and I think Ivea sort of brought this this uh, uh, kind of brought this to mind. You know, there are research. There's research that has been done, and because of the you know like anthropological research, because of the cultural views of the person who was doing the observing they saw something that was in their framework and missed the whole thing. Or, you know, um, the first studies of apes, they were, that were done by men, did not think about it in a different way. And then Jane Goodall could bring in all sorts of other things. And um, even, you know, uh, our perception of how, um, an egg and a sperm, you know, join up that the sperm was, you know, this is the sperm that won. Nope. Turns out chemically the egg chooses which sperm. So, and, and, and so, and, and so that, that humility again, to not assume that you are right. Um, but we're not paralyzed by that. We can still work with this, with the predictions that we make. Um, I, I wrote up a little, uh, cheat sheet of some thoughts I had about kind of responding to confirmation bias and a number of things that we were mentioning here are on that. I thought it might be useful just to kind of put that out in front of people. But before we do that, I want to bring in our mad botanist. 
<laughs> and um, hey. Just, um, just to add on to what Laura was saying, um, I think that's why it can also be important that once you have an idea that you think um, that, that explains something or a model, run it by more than one scientist from different backgrounds, um, either because they might see something that you miss um, or because certain scientists might operate it differently. You get the idea, like the, the, the thing that I that I'd mentioned before into the chat is that the scientists of the day thought that hysteria was a perfectly reasonable explanation for why women behaved a certain way. And their husbands certainly thought it was very convenient and, and you know, a good explanation, but the women certainly didn't and it missed a lot. And so had they decided to run that by other scientists, perhaps women scientists, they might not have gotten stuck into that mindset. And then there's, I'm sure, lots of examples over history with that and probably still in the making to this day. Um, and so um, that's just another thought. And that's why um, early on, Lindy was saying about how when you have the group getting together to add all of their different thoughts and that can be good because then when you get stuck into your own thinking, then you're gonna miss other possibilities. But when other people begin to talk about them, then it opens up your thinking a lot more, which is another reason tying back to the whole how we disagree thing, why it's so important to be able, more than just school work and smart, it's good to learn how to work together. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to learn how to how to work together because science science is a community sport. It's a community activity, even if we think that it's just even if we imagine just the lone naturalist or the lone whoever out in the middle of the woods by themselves at one with nature. No, mm -mm. no, it's community. social. It's social and it's human constructed, and yeah, there's a lot of limitations there. I do want uh, just I know it's time, so but. Um, to circle back to implicit bias. And I guess touch on what Lindy was saying is that you need to be aware of your own implicit bias. And that is why like with the behavior thing, um, right, uh, children of color are suspended more, right? Because people have their perceptions and how they view kids and how they interpret behavior and, you know, so it's not just science, you know, it's everyday real, real people who are impacted every day. And um, that is definitely something that any educator needs to learn about and educate themselves on. And um, so that you can be uh, more equitable and inclusive that you are at least aware of your biases, but just like Jack said at the beginning, being aware of your biases, that means that then you are on the path to, <laughs> to trying to overcome them, but you're not, it doesn't mean you've gone anywhere down the road. It just means you're now on the road. So it's work and, um, and it's important. You can think of it like, like um, Aikido training or something else like that. You're going out and trying to find people who can help you find your blind spots and your implicit biases, not necessarily with dread, but so that you can train harder to address them. And then you'll be ready for the run, Dory, when they blindfold you and make you fight multiple people at once. <laughs> no, not really. Sounds like you've done that before. No, but I've watched it and thought, oh, no, 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 I'm not ready for that. <laughs> what, what were you going to say, Jack? Oh, I just wanted to 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 bring up a um, a little list that I was I was thinking about, and it sort of touches into a number of things that we've been kind of bouncing around here. Um, and um, so here's my kind of my my short list, um, and so I thought. Um, so Laura, you were talking about this. Um, we got to be humble. And there's some stuff that I believe that's just wrong. And my goal should be to try to get more of the right stuff and less of the wrong stuff over time. Um, the more that my kind of view of the way that the world is and works kind of matches the way that the world is and works. Um, that's going to be really useful for me and my society. Um, the idea of following evidence and being willing to change your mind in the presence of evidence. 
is a mindset. And that if my identify, that's supposed to be identity. <laughs> this is again, the dyslexic. Um, so if I, 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 sorry, you know, identify, yeah. So I want to identify with the process, not with the conclusion. So I don't want to get my ego wrapped around any conclusion that I've made. But what I want to do is identify myself with, I came at, to this conclusion through this evidence, this process of examining evidence. And if evidence takes me in a different direction, I need to be willing to change my conclusions based on that. So I don't have any loyalty to a specific conclusion. I have loyalty to the process of evaluating evidence and changing my mind in the presence of changing evidence. I talked a little bit about that, that little slider I had um, is the, the sort of what's called Bayesian reasoning um, and where, you, where things are on a continuum of, pro, of provisional acceptance. Um, and that's different than the dichotomous right-wrong thinking. The more we get ourselves out of that right-wrong thinking, I think we are in a much more useful place. Another is to embrace people who disagree with you. And what I want to do is think of it as an opportunity to learn. So if you have a different um, perspective on something, you are not a threat to my idea. You are an opportunity. This might be the next person who, this might be my, if I'm constant, I want to constantly be looking for opportunities to change my mind. And this person who disagrees with me, if we can engage in real discourse, is going to be an opportunity to change my mind, not a threat. People who disagree with me are not ignorant. They're not stupid. They're not evil. We just disagree. Um, we've mentioned the language of uncertainty. This is something we can easily teach our students to do, to be able to, um, to be able to not get themselves locked into a relationship with the first pretty hypothesis that comes to their head but to be more flexible in their thinking. So this is, this is words that scientists use, and it makes us sound a little bit uh, wishy-washy, but it is really useful for kind of keeping kind of track of where we are in our own epistemology. Another big trap are ideological extremes. Um, if our identity gets wrapped in as part of a group, then changing my mind about something is disloyal to that group. And um, I now am going along with, I'm now solving my math problem wrong because of, um, I'm not looking at evidence, I'm looking at what is gonna be a win for my team. And that is going to hurt me as an individual and as a part of, as a, as a player in, the, in a society. If there's an idea that particularly feels good to me, I might want to look at that with particular skepticism. It doesn't mean it's wrong, but just realize that the things that, the wrong things that feel right to me are going to be the ones that I'm going to let into my thinking the most because it feels right. So something feeling right is just a feeling and it doesn't mean that it's right. And so if it feels right, I have to keep that separate, more than I can keep that separate from my brain thinking that is right, I think that that will help me. And finally, there are tools that science uses that aren't really appropriate in all parts of our kind of everyday life, but are really helpful for kind of the big purpose of the scientific method is to try to get around our confirmation bias. That's where the whole kind of double blinded thing comes in, um, using all the data that's in front of you. Um, and now what we're also realizing it's really important to, before you do a study, you come up with what your plan is. So you're, and then follow through with that. And as opposed to modifying your methods partway through the project, because you that will be more likely to get you results that you think you should have. So these were just a, a smattering of some possible 
buffers against that, uh, against this, you know, the the ogre of all comfort of all cognitive biases. Um, and I hope that that is uh, there. I think there's some some food there for thought. Um, I'm going to bounce over to the um, the gallery view here. If there's anybody else that has a thought, comment, or idea that you wanted to share that you didn't have an, an opportunity to do so, I'd like to invite you to do that at this time. And um, well, I, uh, folks, thank you so much for, um, for, for coming and playing with us today. Um, I've really um, enjoyed being able to um, explore some of these ideas. Again, the G.I. Joe fallacy, um, just you know, knowing is not half the battle. Um, and just um, as, as Laura was suggesting, I think one of the, the greatest things we can do is arm ourselves with humility and go forth with curiosity. Um, and the more that we can instill that in our students, I think that we're, 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 we're in a better place. Are there any other comments, thoughts, or ideas? When in doubt, use subjunctive. <laughs> use the subjunctive. Love it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, and uh, I think it might be fun to also explore some other um, cognitive biases and logical fallacies that we regularly hit in our classrooms in other discussions. Um, and thank you all for, for being with us today. Bye-bye, everybody.